about the next phase of this particular series that we've been working on. And uh, the big idea of this message is, is, is very simple. It says this, our bad choices may have hard consequences. Our bad choices may have hard con consequences, but God can redeem and restore his children. I'm going to say that again. Our bad choices may have hard consequences, but God can redeem and restore His children. Amen. If you're not happy about that today, I don't know what's going to get you happy. Because I'm telling you right now, that's everybody's need. Because our choices, what we've done, the things that we've had go on in our lives, if we couldn't be redeemed from that, then we are... It's a pitiful situation. Pity, pitiable. Pitiable. Right? Pitiful. So I want to read to you today a passage out of the book of Jeremiah, chapter 25. And this is Jeremiah talking to the Israelites about their infidelity. Okay? And, and, and many times, Israel was equated, throughout the entire Old Testament, is, Israel was equated to as a woman. Okay? And, and, and they were the bride of God. They... They, they were God's people. And every single time they turned from their ways, it was referred to as adultery. That they were being adult, they were, they were fornicating, they were going away from God, and, and they were being uh, unfaithful to their God. And, 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 and God talks to Jeremiah, and I want to read to you. Verse 1 says this. And the word came to Jeremiah concerning all the people of Judah. In the fourth year of Jehoiakim, the son of Josiah, king of Judah. That was the first year of Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon. Now, Josiah was a Messiah type. He was the one who found the book of the law in the temple and turned everything back. And everybody came back to God. They tore down the, the bells and the Asherah poles. And they, and they took idols out of the, of the temple itself. And he brought everybody back to the worship of God. And then his son went and did it all again. And this is the pattern of the people of Judah, the people of Israel. And, and, and Jeremiah is speaking out against them, saying, uh, Which Jeremiah the prophet spoke to all the people of Judah and all inhabitants of Jerusalem for 23 years. From the 13th year of Josiah, the son of Ammon, king of Judah, to this day, the word of the Lord has come to me, and I have spoken persistently to you, but you have not listened. You have neither listened nor inclined your ear to hear, although the Lord persistently sent to you all the servants, the prophets, saying, Turn now every one of you from his evil way and evil deeds, and dwell upon the land that the Lord has given you, and your fathers from the old and forever do not go after other gods and serve and worship them. I'm sorry. <laughs> I don't think I'd be doing this thing if I was a veteran of 23 years and nobody listened. That would be frustrating. Jeremiah was faithful. His ministry yielded zero fruit. And yet he faithfully preached and pro prophesied to the people for 23 years. God wanted them to forsake their idols and restore relationship with him, but they refused to listen. Now I have a, now I have a question for you. What do you. Think about it for just a second. What are some modern day idols? Oh, pastor, we don't have modern day idols. We don't, we don't, we don't have idols in America. That's silliness. What I'm saying is this, guys. We, we may not have some, you know, the Asherahs and the Baals, but we have something. For, one of the first things that come to my mind is we worship at the altar of materialism, which feeds our needs to build our egos through the acquisition of more stuff. We, we, we worship the almighty dollar. Another one, we worship at the altar of our own pride and ego. This often takes the form of obsession with our careers, our jobs, 
and our status. Another way we worship this, in this day and age, we worship idols. Uh, man, we may worship the idol of mankind through naturalism and the power of science. You know what's funny? I went to the uh, the museums down in New York, and I walked out of those museums saying, "The museums of our country, the science museums of our country, are the temples of atheism." Because every single truth claim coming out of those things is a faith claim. And it's, it's the temples of humanism. And uh, don't tell me we don't worship idols. Go, go to the, uh, the Smithsonian's and look, walk through the science parts of it. Mm. Things that are considered, have always been considered theory, are presented as fact. I have no problem with theories. I have no problem with false facts. Things that are propped up as facts. Fourth, they can listen to this one. Religion and all of its activity and theological argumentation can become a source of self-realization. Our attempt, human attempt, to reach God. Right? That's an idol. We can't do that. We can't do that. Finally, the last one, I, and I'm sure you can come up with more. I'm just trying to make the, the point here. You see, see the point I'm trying to make? That we do have idols. The last one I, I can kind of come up with was perhaps most destructive, we worship at the altar of self-indulgence. Hedonism, or the fulfillment of our needs and desires at the expense of ourselves and others. Overindulgence, the life of excess. You know, the number one problem with marriages in America is financial. How can that be? Did you know that the majority of Americans in, this, in, in our country right now are in up to their eyeballs in debt? But we need the stuff. So we go to the God of MasterCard and Visa. And we say... We will serve you if you give us more stuff. And everything I have, the, my weekly paycheck will go to fill your coffers. And I will sacrifice the, for my first and my best at the altar of my stuff. So basically, we have the same exact gods that the Israelites did. We, everything we just talked about is exactly what they were doing, except they put... Uh, uh, a thing up that they could bow down to. But they, all of it was about self-realization, the fact that they were, uh, they were the most important thing on the planet, and, uh, and it was just basically just, a, you know, like Solomon said, there's nothing new under the sun. So in, in verse 8, Jeremiah says this, Therefore, thus says the Lord of hosts, because you have not obeyed my words, behold, I will send from all the tribes of the north, declares the Lord. And for King Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, my servant, and I will bring them against this land and its inhabitants and against all these surrounding nations. Your choices, what you worship, has consequences. What he's saying is this. You love your idols? So much. Let's see how you do when the armies come. Let's see how they take care of you. Let's see how, they, how you fare under those idols when you cry out to them under siege by Nebuchadnezzar. See what happens. And I would say to you, you love your idols so much? Let's see if they can really sustain you. Let's see if they can really give you joy. Let's see if those things that you hold so high in our culture today, let's see if they really fill the hole inside your heart like I can. He's not going to cause you. He, God said, I'm going to give these people the, the choice to love me or hate me. You know, why did he do that? Why, why would God do that? If he knew that the best thing for us was to be in relationship with him, why did he give us a choice? How many people 
love to be told what to do. How many people love when somebody says, you can do this and you can't do that and you have no choice? No, we hate that. God loves you, so he gave you a choice. The fact remains that he still is the best thing for us. But we often choose our other way. Everybody say, shuv. No, no, that's not good enough. Say, shuv. Shuv. Okay, next part, if you're taking notes, the two-way turn. Here we go. So I want to prove to you that God is not this God who just loves to take you out. You make a choice, and like, like, the, like the pagan gods of old that we, we kind of adopted into our understanding of who God is, right? The Thor and, and the, the figure of like lightning when, you know, comes down from the sky when Zeus is unhappy with us, right? It's not, is that the heart of God? Is God, no, let me read it to you. And this is one of my favorite passages in all scripture. It's, it's hanging in my office. Here we go. Jeremiah 29. This is after, this, this is in sequence here. Verse 11, for I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans for your welfare, not for evil, to give you a future and a hope. Then you will call upon me and you will come and pray to me and I will hear you. I will see, you will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. I will be found by you, declares the Lord, and I will restore. Everybody say shuv. I will restore your fortunes and gather you from all the nations and all the places where I have driven you, declares the Lord. I will bring you back to the place from which I sent you into exile. The Hebrew word for restore in verse 14 is this word shuv, okay? Which means to turn back, to turn to, return, to restore, bring back, to recover, okay? That's that word shuv. We would trans, this word is used over a thousand times in scripture. And we would translate this word, repent. Wait a minute. Wait, wait, hold on. This is God talking. Wait, God's repenting? Interesting thought. God has said, I will turn when you seek me and when you come after me, I will turn what is bad in your life, into something great. Restoration after rebellion requires a turnaround. Restoration after rebellion re- requires a turnaround. I don't care if, you're, if you've never asked Jesus into your heart, you've never been to a church before, or you've been here for a thousand years. Some of you are like, that's me. Yeah. I don't care if our choices, rebellion exists within our heart and Uh, restoration after rebellion requires a turnaround. 2 Chronicles 7.14 says, if my people... Now, I I understand this is being written to the Israel. I I get that. Does he know? No, I know. Okay, I did some studying. I know. But I also know that Jesus said in the New Testament that you are no longer my servants, you are my friends. You are my people. And I'm going to place my spirit in you. So I would think that would qualify us as the people of God. Okay? If my people who are called by my name humble themselves, say humble, and pray and seek my face and shuv, it's the same word. Translated turn. It's the same word. If they seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven, I will forgive their sin, and I will heal their land. The path to restoration is to trust God, call upon him, and seek him with all your heart. You need to shuv, and then he will shuv. It's a double turn. We turn to God, and he's like, yeah, yeah. This is what I wanted all the time. Yes, absolutely. Let's, let's turn and go together. The double turn. When God sees us humbling ourselves before him and not just seeking what he can provide, but actually seeking him. 
How many, how many times in prayer do we just sit down and, and list out a lit things that we want? Like rubbing the genie's bottle. When God's like, no. The whole point is, I want you to want me. That's what that whole Eden thing was. That's why I created you. And that's how you live the best life you can possibly live, in relationship with me. So when you go down that path, when you follow your own way, there's a way which seems right to a man, but at the end thereof are the ways of death. I am the way, the truth, and the life. When we go our own way, we should expect it to to end poorly. When we follow the gods of our time, we should expect it to end poorly. And he's just saying, turn, shuv, and I will restore. If you turn, I'll restore. Same word, shuv. Isn't that cool? If we shuv, turn, our hearts and wholly commit and surrender to the Lord, then he will shuv, restore us. He's the fixer of broken things. The other day I took my kids to the uh, the way our house works is that when we, when we go through our, our uh, uh, seltzer cans, there's a bag at the bottom of the stairs, and then there's another bag, and then there's nine, ten bags of cans. And my wife won't throw them away. She's a recycler. So we have these bags, and eventually it's daddy and the kid's job, right, Lincoln, to go and go to the recycling thing, and we recycle our cans. And the kids get a real kick out of this because they stick the cans in, and then they hear this noise. Okay? It become, it, I mean, this is literally what it becomes. It compresses. The, they put, like, they put the, the cans in the chopper thing, and it goes, and it goes, beep, 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 and then, you know, the whole thing. It's really kind of fun. What they also get a kick out is at the end of the whole putting in the cans, they get to push the green button. And Aria likes to do that part. And she, you know, she's almost two years old, and she put a little finger up, pushes the green button, and then, and then a little slip comes out. Okay? Well, why, Dad, so I get the question, what's the slip for? Why are they taking our cans, first off? Why do they care? Why, does this, why is the grocery, it is really weird. Why is the grocery store taking our garbage? And why are we putting it in this thing? And hearing, not only is it a garbage used can, but now they're shredding it. What good is it? And then, why is there this little paper that's coming out of the machine? Like, I don't get this. What, what do we do with this? And then, oh, it makes perfect sense, kids. We're taking this little piece of paper to the, to the store people, and they're going to give us money for it. So Lincoln, being the modern-day Alex P. Keaton, is like, they give us money for cans? That's awesome. Yeah, like I said, he's like, yeah, money for cans? Why do they do that? They take our garbage and they make something out of it. Okay. The last aluminum phone I've ever heard. I don't know. Um, what do you call it when you take an aluminum can to the store and get money back for it? It's called redeeming the can. That's what God does to us. God takes our garbage. He takes our garbage. And because he's God, he's able to take it and make something new out of it. He loves to take that garbage. Do you realize that? He is the happiest recycler in the world. He loves to take our garbage. Romans 8, 28 says this, And we know that for, all, for those who love God, all things work together for good, for those who are called according to his purpose. Now that's a good translation. There's another translation I like better than that. Here we go. And we know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him and who have been called according to his purpose. God works together for the good. All the garbage, the bad choices, either that you have done or have been done to you, 
All those things, bad choices, miserable circumstances, heartbreak, consequences, unmet expectation. This sin ravaged world. We give it to God. And in his divinity and in his, in his ability, he's able to take all of those things in some way. Now, remember what I said. These are, these are the lists I just gave you. They're not good things. They're garbage. I'm not saying that God works all things, gives you all good things. I'm saying we have, we've been gone through. We've made choices. People have made choices on our behalf. Uh, circumstances, they're, some of them are very bad. But in God's economy, nothing is wasted. He takes everything, every bit of garbage that has been squeezed into our life. And in his divinity, he can make good out of it. He can take it and make something good out of it. You didn't know God was into recycling. But he is. He's been recycling for thousands of years. He's been recycling for thousands of years. And he has a desire to take what is in your life. Now, I'm not saying everything in your life is is good. I'm actually saying there's probably some significant garbage in your life. Sorry, that sounds really harsh. But we live in a sin-ravaged world. And I know that I got my own garbage. And God takes it and does something with it. I did some research as to what they do with these. And do you know what the majority of this ends up becoming? Not a cell phone. This. The majority of the garbage that is put into recycling becomes a brand new can able to be filled up and refresh somebody who's thirsty. This is what causes, this is what your garbage can turn into. And I'm saying that the garbage that that has been in your life, God can take that and God can make it into something more beautiful than you could have imagined if you'll give it to him, if you'll surrender it to him, if you'll turn to him, and then he can use that to help somebody else, to refresh somebody else who's thirsty, who's gone through down a similar road as you. Some of the best counselors in the world are people who have dealt with their own garbage. They can sympathize where everybody else can only empathize. What you have gone through may not be good. The choices that you made have tur- may have turned out very badly. But just like the Israelites, God's saying, that's not my goal for you. That's not my heart for you. That's not my heart for you. Because you know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you and not to harm you. Plans to give you a hope and a future. That's what I- my heart is for you today. You know, maybe you say, you don't know, Pastor Dave, I'm beyond redemption. Or maybe you're saying, it's just too hard. I'm going to give you one of the most basic passages of Scripture out there, and I want you to listen very carefully. I want you to listen to this like you've never heard it before. And that's hard to do, especially if you've been in the church for a long time. John 3.16, here we go. For God so loved you. Are you in the world? Yeah, you guys, you guys live on the world? That's good, okay. Some of you are like, I don't know. You do, <laughs> okay, you do. Reality check, you do. For God so loved you that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him should not perish 
but have eternal life. That's what he wants for you. You're not too far from redemption. That's what he's willing, that's the distance he's willing to go to make sure that you can be recycled, that you can be made whole, and that your life going forward can be with him. He gave his son. I love you. But I'm telling you, you asked for my son. Sorry. Find somebody else. That's my kid. I love you, but I'm just going to say, and I think you're going to say a big amen to this, God loves you more. He loves you more. He just does. Now, we don't want to stop at 16, because sometimes we stop at 16, and 17 is so important. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world. He didn't send his son into the world to condemn you. We often look at Jesus and we go, oh, I don't measure up. Oh, God, Jesus, how could I possibly? That's not why he was here. If he wasn't as perfect as he was, he wouldn't have been able to do the things he did for you. So I'm telling you, stop saying, I could never be who God is. And the, the answer is, you're right. He's God, he's Jesus. But he came not so that you could feel condemned by his perfection. He came so that his perfection could redeem you. He didn't send his son into the world to condemn you. Let's keep reading. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn you, but in order that you, the world, might be saved through him. Might be saved through him. He doesn't want you to feel condemned by his perfection. He wants his perfection to save you. The word save here is a Greek word. Sozo. And it means to redeem, to rescue from danger, destruction, to make well, heal, restore to health. Sound like another Hebrew word we've been talking about today? He's all about the restoration. He's all about the recycling. He's all about the restoring. Our choices and the things of this world can get us into some really bad spots. But he wants to restore you. That's his heart for you today. God thinks that who you are as a person is worth redeeming, rescuing, making well, healing. You're worth the trouble of some divine recycling. He could have got lazy like I do. If you're really eco-conscious, forgive me. Sometimes I don't want to walk down the stairs and put my can in the recycling bags that are piling up at the bottom of my stairs. So I slip one into the garbage. Sorry, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Shame. Oh, look at ah. Oh. Now, my God, you are worth every step from heaven to this earth Every stripe upon his back, every nail in his hands, every thorn in his brow, every spear in his side, you are worth all the trouble in heaven and earth to be redeemed, restored, and healed. That's the heart of God today. So I don't know where you're at today. I don't know what you're thinking. I don't know where your mind is. But I'm telling you today, God is waiting to restore. And it doesn't have to be a huge thing. It could be even be a little thing. It could be a mindset. God wants to restore. He's in the business of restoration today and forever. The heart of God is to restore your relationship with him and redeem you. All of you. Not just the good parts. You hear what I'm saying? He wants to redeem you. All of you. He wants to take the garbage and make it valuable again. You don't know what's been done to me, Pastor. I have some real baggage. I know. Life hits, and life is pretty brutal. But we serve a great God, 
And he could take that garbage and he can make it into something beautiful that will cause you to be able to bless people you never even knew that you could bless because of the things that you've gone through or the choices that you have made. That's how he does things. That's who our God is. He likes to take the garbage in your life and turn it into something that can be used to strengthen you and also those around you. That's who my God is. How many people have ever taken a wrong turn in your life? You've gone down a bad path. How many people have gotten off the track that God would have liked them to be on? I have. I have. And I have to be honest. Those decisions have caused some pain. But I can tell you right now that when I've given those to God, I've confessed my sins, given them over to God, he's been able to use the perspective and the, the things that were so bad to bless other people in the future. My ministry has been impacted by, this sounds terrible, please don't. My ministry has been impacted favorably by some of my worst decisions. Because I've been able to give them to God and he's been able to restore them, restore me. But now I can relate to people on a totally different level because of that. That I couldn't before. It's possible. God loves you. God left his throne in heaven to redeem you. Know that you are worth it. You're worth it. He loves you. Would you stand with me for a moment?